Well, the title this morning is Life and Judgment Through the Son. Now, it's been about three or four weeks since I last shared with you in John's Gospel. So just to quickly recap where we left off last time. You remember we were in John chapter 5, where we looked at the passage where Jesus came to the pool of Bethesda. And there was a man who had been lame for 38 years, unable to walk for 38 years. Think about that. And Jesus healed him and said to him, rise, take up your bed and walk. And he did. And as he did, he met the, the Jews. And they wanted to know why he was carrying his bed on the Sabbath. And he told them, told them the whole story, told them what happened. He'd been lame for 38 years. And this man, Jesus, said to him, rise, take up your bed and walk. And he was completely healed. And the amazing thing is that they were not excited about the healing. They were concerned about the fact that he was carrying his bed on the Sabbath. So they wanted to catch up with this Jesus and interrogate him. Why he did this on the Sabbath, why he broke the Sabbath. So that's where we come in, okay? For this reason, the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him because he had done these things on the Sabbath. That's religion. But Jesus answered them, my father has been working until now and I have been working. Therefore, the Jews sought, sought all the more to kill him because he not only broke the Sabbath, but also said that God was his father making himself equal with God. Okay, so that's the situation. The real issue was not that Jesus violated the Sabbath, but their interpretation of it. Jesus did not break the Sabbath law. Uh, he didn't break any of the law. He fulfilled the law completely. But their interpretation of it is what he fell foul of. God gave the Sabbath as a day of rest. Amen. A day when we could come together and worship God and a day that we could spend with our family and friends, just resting, relaxing, socializing and uh, enjoying ourselves in that way. But of course, they turned it into a day of suffering in which next to nothing, even relieving suffering, could be done. How tragic is that? That's religion. So Jesus implied, well, the Father is working. The Father doesn't stop working on the Sabbath when human need demanded it. Some people think that, you know, when God created the world in six days, then he never worked again after that. No, he never did any creative works in that sense. But God has been working ever since, upholding the universe, keeping everything moving and going. A blessing this world and caring for this world, providing for this world. Every day he does that. Amen? You know, every day, have you noticed that even on the Sabbath, the sun rises and the sun sets? You notice that? Yeah. And on the Sabbath, the tides of the oceans ebb and flow, even on the Sabbath. The winds blow, even on the Sabbath. All these things happen on the Sabbath. The rain comes on the Sabbath and waters the crops by which we are fed. In fact, God stretches out his hand and feeds all of his creation, every living thing, even on the Sabbath. And so the Father doesn't stop working. And Jesus said, and I'm working with my Father, relieving suffering on the Sabbath. Now this made them angry for two reasons. First of all, calling God his Father was a claim to equality with God. He made himself equal with God. Also, the statement made God a participator in his crime of breaking the Sabbath. So not only did Jesus break the Sabbath, you're saying the Father broke the Sabbath as well. Incidentally, the verbs broke and said are both in the continuous uh, tense in, in that verse we just read. When it says that uh, not only did he uh, he broke the Sabbath. Not only did, he, did they say he broke the Sabbath, he kept on breaking the Sabbath. 
He didn't say, oh dear, that upset them and uh, I didn't realise that that was wrong and I, I won't do that again. No, he kept on doing that. He kept on doing good, working on the Sabbath and upsetting them. It was an ongoing thing. And he kept on saying that God was his father. He didn't withdraw that either. It was a continuous thing. Equality with God is how the Jews understood the claim that God was his father. They understood that he was saying, you are saying you're of the same nature as God. You are God. Jesus never disputed this interpretation. No other inference could be drawn from his words. Jesus did not charge them with twisting his words. He didn't say, hey, come on, you, you're just playing with words. There. You're twisting what I said. No, that's exactly what he was saying. And he didn't back off from it. The result was that they sought the more to kill him because of that claim. He never backed away from the claim, but kept repeating it and got the same response. Here are a couple of examples. Later on in John chapter 8, we find him saying this. Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Then they took up stones to throw at him. Now, we know the implications of that. First of all, he was saying that he's... He's eternal. He's always existed. He was even there before Abraham, which was 2,000 years before. But of course, he used the divine name, the name that God used for himself when he revealed himself in the burning bush to Moses. I am that I am. Who shall I say sent me? Say, I am has sent you. The, the God who was and is and always will be, who's always existed, the eternal God. Tell them he has sent you. Jesus took that name upon himself before Abraham was I am not I was I am and then in John chapter 10 I and my father are one then the Jews took up stones again to stone him Jesus answered them many good works I have shown you from my father for which of these works do you stone me the Jews answered him saying for a good work we do not stone you but for blasphemy and because you being a man make yourself God so it's very clear. They both understood very clearly what Jesus was saying. Jesus was very clear about it and they understood what he was saying and what he meant by what he was saying, that he was equal with the Father. Okay, then, then we, we, we see the incredible, um, can I say, balance of that. In, when we look at the life of Jesus, as we approach Christmas, we see the wonder of, of, of this incredible thing that Jesus is God manifest in the flesh. Jesus answered there and said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the father do. For whatever he does, the son also does in like manner. For the father loves the son and shows him all things that he himself does. And he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. We got this question yesterday in our Q&A. How do we understand the humanity of Jesus and the deity of Jesus? Two natures in one person. Jesus, though eternally the Son of God, is now God manifest in the flesh. Every bit as human as you and I except for sin. In all points, except for sin. He never ceased to be God when he came to earth, but he added to his deity full humanity. And here we see what true humanity was meant to look like. God manifest in the flesh. God created us unique. Only we human beings have a spirit, body, soul, and spirit. Why? Because we were meant to be indwelt by God. That God would come and make his home with us, live in us, but live through us so that the rest of creation would see the moral image of God in us. Now, we know that was spoiled in the fall, but Jesus came to show what God manifest in the flesh is like. On earth, even though he is fully God, co-equal, co-eternal with the Father, he subordinated himself to the Father and was the only human being to live in total obedience to him. There's a psalm, I think it's Psalm 40. It's quoted in the New Testament uh, as Jesus being the fulfillment of it, where it says this, um, 
sacrifice an offering you did not desire. God never wanted sacrifices. What did he want? Obedience. Someone who would do his will. And he said, a body you have prepared for me. Lo, I come in the volume of this book, it is written of me, to do your will, O God. You created a body and that body exists for no other purpose. My body is for no other purpose, said Jesus, but to do the will of God. Amen? Amen. He was the only one to totally live in obedience to the Father. From his first recorded saying until the end of his earthly life, he was obedient to the Father. You remember the first recorded saying of Jesus? When he was 12, they found him in the temple. He was lost, you remember? They said, what are you doing here? Don't you know that I should be about my Father's business? That's not a coincidence. So that was the first thing, the first mention of Jesus saying anything in his earthly life. I'm here about my Father's business. And then he was obedient, the Bible says, even unto death, even the death of the cross. In everything he obeyed the Father. Sin originated in Lucifer, who repeatedly said, I will. If you look at those verses of Lucifer, I will ascend to, to, to the throne of God. I will do this, I will do that. And he brought that rebellious spirit to earth and tricked Adam and Eve into saying, not my will, but thy, uh, not thy will, but mine be done. Amen. We saw that last week. When, when God said, don't touch that tree, then Satan come along and said, no, you touch that tree, it'll be good for you. Adam and Eve said to God, not your will, but mine be done. But Jesus broke that power by saying, not my will, but thine be done. Both men, each in a garden, garden of Eden and the garden of Gethsemane. And as Jesus faced the cross, saw the horror and the, 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 the dread and the pain and everything that would come upon him. He said, Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass me, but nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. He was obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. We've already seen that in verse um, 34 of chapter 4 in John, Jesus said, my meat, my very meat, my food is to do the will of God, the will of my Father. So in this he shows us what godliness is. It's God behaving in humanity. And when we look at the life of Jesus and we see the incredible fruit that has come from that life, he's showing us this is what we are meant to enjoy. A life in which God is living in us and through us as we just yield our humanity to his deity. So he will come and manifest his life through us and we will see incredible fruit and blessing in our lives. What a wonderful thing that is. He refused to try to be the cause of his own effect. He never tried to make something happen. He just said, God, what do you, what do you want me to do? He, he only did those things that the Father showed him. Wow, that's incredible. Because that phrase, trying to be the cause of our own effect, can sum up a lot of Christianity today. I have to confess, you know, as a pastor, that I thought that's what we had to do, go out and make something happen. We were taught, have a vision. Get a vision of what you want to achieve in this church, in this town. You know, cast your vision to the church, project your goal and, and, and then get the troops together and pray and fast and, and make it happen, you know. Very tiring, friend. Very exhausting. Many pastors got burnt out on that, I can assure you. We are not to be the cause of our own effect. We're to present our bodies to him as a living sacrifice. Let him work through us and in us. His work, that's Jesus' work and godliness were the direct result of the manifestation of God's life through him. This is the mystery of godliness. Great is the mystery of godliness. Paul says, God manifest in the flesh. What does it take to be godly? God. <laughs> I remember the conference when I heard that. I thought, oh my goodness, why didn't somebody tell me that? Years ago. I've been trying to be godly. 
trying all I can to be godly after all these years, trying and failing and trying and failing. What does it take to be godly? God. Let God work through you. That's why I teach now. Don't live for God. Stop living for God. Let God live through you. That's the Christian life. Amen. Godliness is the life of God in the soul of men and women. Or as James put it this way, of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Amen. So as we've just seen, the Father loves the Son and shows him his plans. And the Son delights to do his will. That's, that's the Christian life. You know, we, 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 we were asked this question yesterday about prayer, the true nature of prayer. And again, the Christian church has got it so wrong. It's like bringing a shopping list to God now. All the things we want God to do for us and give to us and all the things we want him to fix. And we've got this list and it's almost like a role reversal, you know, like we're, we're, we're the lords and we give God's the servant and we give him the instructions for today. This is what I want you to do. This, 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 this. this. That's not prayer. Prayer is enjoying a relationship with God and, and God brings us into his counsel. And he shows us what he's doing, his plans, his purpose, and how we can be involved in that. Then we pray according to the will of God, and God answers those prayers. We're, we're workers together with God. Amen? Amen. And that's what Jesus was saying. The Father loves the Son and shows him his plans, and the Son delights to do his will. In the life of Christ, the Father leads and the Son follows. So telling the man at Bethesda to take up his bed and walk was not an independent act of Jesus, but was what the Father showed him to say. You remember there were a lot of people that were sick there, but he only went to one man. And he said, I, I, I can't do anything but that which the Father shows me to do. Jesus said, if they marveled at this, they would see even greater things. What does that mean? Do you remember he said something similar once? He said, if we believe in him, the works that he does shall we do also and greater works than these that's what he's saying greater in number because of the church being those that have the life of Jesus and, 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 and live by his life and see the fruit that comes from him working in us and through us we see greater things than these you know okay we look at the life of Jesus we say that's wonderful yes he says but I'm going to multiply that through the body of Christ and pour my life through you so Jesus lives in us that we too can be about our Father's business. We can say with, with Jesus, you know, really, I'm here for one purpose only, to do the will of God, whatever that is, every day. When we believe this, that's when our ministry begins. Okay, so let's go on to verse 21. For as the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the Son gives life to whom he will for the father judges no one the father judges no one but has committed all judgment to the son that all should honor the son just as they honor the father he who does not honor the son does not honor the father who sent him now just keep in mind the context here jesus is having a conversation or a debate really with with the jews who are challenging his claim to deity. Now Jesus doesn't back away from that, but he adds two other things that give strength to this case that he is the son of God. And those two things we're gonna look at now. First of all, the son is a life giver. The son is a life giver, okay? To understand that, the Bible teaches that God has appointed two representative men, Adam and Jesus. And when God looks at the world, he only sees two kinds of people. You're either in Adam, which is where we all began our journey, or, or, or you're in Christ. That's when you're born again. Amen. Uh, they're similar because they're representative and God deals with the ones that they represent on the basis of what, how they perform. The first man was of the earth, made of dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven. He's called the second man on the last Adam. 
both received their earthly life directly from God by impartation. God created Adam from the dust and then he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. What about Jesus? He didn't get his life from Joseph, but God placed, as it were, the, the seed of the Logos, the eternal Logos, in the womb of Mary. And, and, and Jesus developed in the womb and was born. Both of them received their life directly from God by impartation. In contrast, all others, like us, receive their life by generation or offspring. Both represent their seed and pass on to them their life form. Whatever life form they have, that's what they pass on. Adam never passed on the life that God gave him, but a life made in his own image of sin. If he hadn't sinned, he would have passed on that divine life. But we know that something happened. He sinned and, and he had an image of his own now. It's called an image of sin and death. The Bible has a, a term for that. It's called flesh. Flesh is humanity disconnected from God. When, when, when Adam sinned, God vacated the spirit and plunged the soul into darkness. And that's how man was left. We read about that here in Genesis 5, 1 and then verse 3. This is the book of the genealogy of Adam. In the day that God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. Then came the fall. And Adam lived 130 years and begot a son in what? His own likeness after his image and named him Seth. And so that's the human race. Everyone is born as an offspring of fallen Adam. That's why we were born in sin. Jesus never sinned, so he gave his life to his seed. When we're born again, the first, Adam, first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a what? Life-giving spirit. He gave us life. This is the whole theme of John's Gospel. Receiving eternal life by believing in Jesus, everlasting life. Everlasting life doesn't just mean life that will go on forever and ever. It's a quality as well as quantity. It's, Zoe is the word for life. Zoe means life as possessed by the one who gave it. We are partakers now of the divine nature through the new birth. This is how we're to understand John 5.26, which we're coming to. As the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself and to be a life giver. Now the resurrection life of Jesus is a vital ingredient of the gospel. The gospel, <laughs> it's very simple and yet it's very much misunderstood. There are three parts, you know, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 50, Jesus died for our sins, he was buried, and he rose again. Now, all Christians believe that. But it's what do you believe about that? See, people believe that Jesus died for their sin, but they don't believe it's a finished work. Many Christians don't. If I can just um, say, for example, the Catholics believe that every, every um, uh, mass is a re-crucifixion of Christ transubstantiation that this is the literal body of Jesus being broken again and this is his blood being shed again and, and so he's being crucified we, you know, cr the son of God is being crucified every week now we can criticize the, um, the Roman Catholic Church for that but a lot of Protestants don't move beyond the cross they, they do not see it as a finished work for example they believe that we, in order to be forgiven, we're still going to be forgiven for every sin. And if we don't confess every single sin, we will not be forgiven. Well, friends, no one will be forgiven. No one has confessed every single sin. No, you, you cannot do that. No, nobody has done that. The fact is, when you put your trust in Jesus, he forgave you all your sins. Past, present, and future. You know... Uh, he that spared not his son, but delivered him up for us all. He, he, it was a perfect word. He said, it is finished. It's done. 
The sin question has been dealt with. Amen. He made one sacrifice once for all and sat down at the right hand of God and has perfected us forever. We are complete in him. So, you know, we're not meant to have sin consciousness. We go beyond the cross. That's why we don't have, you know, wooden crosses with Jesus still hanging there. He's not on the cross. Amen. He was buried, then he rose again. So we go on to the resurrection. We will never experience the resurrection life of Jesus if we don't come to terms with the finality of his death. It's finished. He died. He's dealt with sin. All sin was imputed to him. His righteousness was given to us. We go beyond the cross to the resurrection. But then again, a lot of Christians don't understand the, the teaching, the New Testament teaching on the resurrection. They all believe that Jesus rose from the dead. Every Christian believes that he didn't stay in the grave. He rose from the dead. But friends, he rose from the dead so that he might live in you and live through you. That's what this is all about. That's the gospel. That's the gospel. Amen. So the resurrection life of Jesus is a vital ingredient of the gospel. Now we're going to the second thing that Jesus uh, spoke about. First of all, he says, you know, the son is a life giver. He that believes in the son receives life from the son. This, this everlasting life receives that freely from God. But then he says this, all judgment has been given to the son. You think about that. He said the father is not going to judge anyone. He's given all judgment to the son. There is a day of judgment. And it's the son who will judge. Most assuredly I say to you, he who hears my words and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. Most assuredly I say to you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself and has given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the Son of Man. So let's look at that. The hour has come when believers will receive the very life of God. When Jesus said the, the hour is coming, he meant he was going to go to the cross, he was going to die, then he was going to ri rise from the dead and be a life giver. That's the hour he's talking about. Um, the hour has come when believers will receive the very life of God, the divine nature, as promised to the water, uh, the woman at, at the well. You remember? You, if you, you know, come to me, I will give you living water. Living water. Or as he said in John chapter 7, whoever believes in me, out of his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. That's what Jesus gives. He gives life. Now, in order to explain how Jesus gives life, John returns to his main theme, which is he who believes has everlasting life. It's through believing in Jesus. Salvation is immediate upon believing in the Father who sent Jesus. True belief in the Father is belief in the Son, and true belief in the Son is belief in the Father because they are one in this work. The Father sent Jesus into the world and has told us to believe in the Son. So you believe in the Son, you believe in the Father. You believe in the Father, you believe in the Son. Those who believe have assurance of salvation and will not come, even come into judgment. I was with some friends this week and uh, they recommended to me a, a certain preacher and he's a good preacher. And, and I, I, I just went onto um, YouTube and chose one, one sermon from him. I probably chose the wrong one. And it was all about, you know, he basically said, you know, you, you, you are born again by believing in Jesus. But then he went on to say that you've got to strive in order to enter. So he's taken it all back upon ourselves. It took me years to get free of all that stuff. I don't want to go back under that again. It's when you, when you believe in Jesus... You are born again, you receive eternal life, you are forgiven, amen, and you have assurance. Under that doctrine, you never get assurance. In fact, they say you can never know whether you're really saved, whether you're born again. It depends on, on the works that you bring forth to show forth your salvation, and you never know right to the end. Friends, the gospel is good news. That's not good news, that's bad news. That's morbid. 
Amen. There's no assurance in that. What Jesus came is to give us eternal life. 98 times in the Gospel of John, he says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you have everlasting life. That's what it comes down to. Believing in him, then you've got assurance, this sweet assurance. Jesus is mine. Amen. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. You know the hymn. Those who believe, said Jesus, have passed. Crossed over, that word means. Crossed over from death to life. We were in death. We're now in life. We're in Jesus. We have everlasting life. They've left the land of the dying for the land of the living. Paul says that he was called to preach the gospel in order to open their eyes, in order to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God and that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance amongst those who are sanctified by faith in me. So we, we leave one realm. Paul says you are no longer darkness but light in the Lord. That's who we are. We are light in the Lord. We have life, not death. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 13, he says, He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of his love. In other words, he's taken us out of Adam into Christ. There is not even a hint in Scripture that this transition could be reversed. There's no mention of the possibility of going back into Adam. We died to that. We are buried. We have raised a new creation in Jesus. That's why this is perfect tense. He has delivered us. He has delivered us from the power of darkness. It indicates a permanent state. This is who we are now. We're in Christ. Not, no longer in Adam. We've left that. We've died to that. And we're now, we've crossed over. And because of that, we will not come into judgment. Not only has the Son been granted this life to give to others, but also he is qualified to judge humanity because he has partaken of it, of humanity, and his sacrifice on our behalf leaves us without excuse. This is why God has given all judgment to the Son. Because Jesus has paid the sacrifice for our sins and only he's qualified to judge humanity in fact humanity is without excuse you see if going back to this other message that i heard if it was about us having to strive to get into the kingdom of heaven then you, you, know, you, you couldn't blame some people saying, look, it's just too hard. And I, and many people have said that to me when they thought that was the gospel. It's too hard to be a Christian. I can't do it. I can't keep it up. So I'm throwing in the towel. But that's not the gospel. We only have to do one thing. Believe that he has done it all. Amen? Amen. Believe that he has done it all. That's why people are without excuse. Because there's nothing you have to do but believe and put your trust in him. Now, why wouldn't people do that? I'm sure you've asked that question. There can only be one answer. They want to remain hostile to God. They do not want to be reconciled to God. You know that God is actually reconciled to the world? God has already reconciled to the world. That's what the Bible teaches. God has been reconciled to the world because of what Jesus did on the cross. Now the gospel is a message to man, be reconciled unto God. He's reconciled to you, now you be reconciled to him. Cease hostilities. Don't any longer be an enemy of God. Receive him. Come to him. And so anyone that doesn't believe in Jesus is only because they want to remain an enemy of God. And that judgment has been given to Jesus, the one who paid the price for them, and we were talking about this yesterday. A number of these things come up about the kind of body that Jesus has in heaven. And, and, and you know, it's, it's like our bodies, our resurrection bodies, the bodies that we will have. There'll be both retention and change. We will retain some features, so we probably will recognise everyone. Sorry about that, folks, but... <laughs> if you don't find me, I'll come looking for you. We'll retain some things, but there'll be change, just like the body of Jesus. But one thing Jesus has reti re retained, and we know, are the nail prints in his hands. 
Amen. When Jesus sits as the judge of all humanity, everyone will see the nail prints in his hands. They'll know that he, be reminded that he died for them. An awful death. Uh, uh, just a death we cannot imagine. The anguish, the pain, not only physically but spiritually that he entered into for their salvation. And they chose not to believe in him. All they had to do was to put their trust in him. That's why God has appointed him to be the judge. In scripture, the, son, the term the son of man was a reference to the Messiah to whom all judgment has been given. Then the sign of the son of man, Jesus said, will appear in heaven and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the son of man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. That will be a terrible day because it means the day of grace has ended. It's now the day of judgment. Now is the day of salvation. God is not judging people. You know, people look at it, something like a, a catastrophe, like a typhoon or a flood or an earthquake and say that's the judgment of God. That's not the judgment of God. God is not judging the world. This is that now is the day of grace. Now is the day of salvation. God is reaching out to the world. But that, when Jesus comes back, the day of grace will end and it will be the day of judgment. Verse 20. Uh, Matthew 26, 20, 64, Jesus said to him, it is as you said, nevertheless I say to you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming in the clouds of heaven. You can see that also in, in Daniel chapter 7 where it speaks about the Son of Man being given the throne and, and everybody coming and, and bowing down before him and serving him. Okay, so we come to, to, towards the end now. Jesus said, do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. I can of myself do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is righteous because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. Now, that verse may surprise you. It may even seem to be contrary to everything I've just said. Over and over again in this gospel, we are told that salvation is for those who believe in Jesus. But here it says, uh, those who have done good to the resurrection of life, those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. Now, the best way I can explain that is, as I close is just to give you this illustration. I was talking to someone once about someone else, a fellow Christian, and I just said, he, you know, he's a really good man. And this person replied instantly, there is none good, no, not one. And I replied immediately, and Barnabas was a good man and full of the Holy Spirit. You see, I know, and you know, that in me, in us, in my flesh, dwells no good thing. Amen? Disconnected from God, there is none good, no, not one. That, that, that verse is speaking about those before they come to Christ. When you come to Christ, his righteousness is imputed to you. And so the fruit of the Spirit is goodness. That's why the Bible says uh, Barnabas was a good man and full of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And, and, and what it means is this, you know, everything we do when we walk in the Spirit... And, and, and every day I can, I can yield my, the members of my body to either serve sin or to serve righteousness, to either obey the flesh or the spirit. Okay, you know that, that civil war goes on in every one of us, that choice we have to make every day on a daily basis. And, and, and as we choose to serve righteousness, as we choose to be led by the spirit, we're empowered by the spirit and everything we do is good. Everything we do is good because it, it comes through the Lord Jesus Christ who perfects all our offerings. That's why when you pray, sometimes you might feel your prayers are uh, pretty weak and pretty amateurish or whatever, and, and you might feel that you haven't done a good job, but that's why we pray at the end in the name of Jesus. He takes that which we place upon the order, he perfects it and offers it to his Father. His, so it's a good work. The Bible says that we're you know, by grace you are saved through faith. That only sells as gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. But then it goes on to say, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto 
good works. This is what this is talking about. We are a people now who offer good works. You're the service you do. When you witness to someone, you know, Satan might come along and beat you up and think that was pretty bad. You know, you didn't do, you know, did more harm than good, didn't it? <laughs> Look at that, how angry he is now. Friends, you did it in the name of Jesus. You did it in faith. You did it in good heart. It's a good work. Jesus takes it and perfects it. So don't beat up on yourself. Don't let Satan beat you up either. Because everything is perfected through the mediation, the high priesthood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's pray together. Father, we want to thank you this morning for so great a salvation that we have in our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you that you've drawn us to yourself. You've opened our eyes. You've helped us to see the beauty, the wonder, the glory of the gospel in the face of your son, Jesus Christ. And Lord, we thank you that uh, you've given us faith to believe in him, to put our trust in him, and to walk with him, to walk in the spirit day by day. And Lord, we do pray that in these days of grace, you will give us opportunities to share this good news with as many people as you lead us to. And we pray that there, we will see many people coming to Christ, many people receiving the free gift of salvation. We ask it for your glory in Jesus' name. Everybody said, Amen. 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 Thanks, Lizzie.